talked a little bit. I think we ended, did we, where did we end off before? We, did we talk about respiration in here? We did. We talked about respiration. We talked about um, aerobic respiration. We mentioned anaerobic cellular respiration. And uh, we sort of ended when it came to muscle fatigue. So we, uh, we talked about muscle fatigue. We talked about how uh, it's a protective mechanism, so we're not going to damage the muscle. We know that the amount of calcium is going to be depleted and that contributes to fatigue. You get a buildup of lactic acid and ADP. That contributes to fatigue as well as we don't have those ATP supplies available. If we don't have enough oxygen, if we don't have enough glycogen, fatigue can set in. What about after exercise? Are we able to cross the finish line of our marathon and be able to be breathing at the same rate that we are breathing right now? No, of course not. So, what has to happen? We need to repay this oxygen debt because we've used a lot of oxygen during our exercise. So we have a little bit of oxygen recovery that needs to take place. During that excessive workout, you know, when, uh, when uh, Halverson has his, uh, his set and he actually drums for three solid hours, he gets pretty tired. And those drumsticks don't really weigh much, but after drumming for three hours, oh, it is awful because of that buildup of lactic acid. Lactic acid, the key word there being acid, it burns, it hurts, it's damaging tissues. That lactic acid needs to get converted back to pyruvic acid. What else happens? Look how much he is sweating. His temperature is up through the roof. Why? Because all <laughs> reactions are going to be going faster as body temperature is elevated. Whew. How long are your set lists really? Oh, I didn't realize it was long. 45 minutes. Very good. When we look at a motor unit. This is where we're going to be headed in the coming weeks when we start looking more at these nervous structures. We can talk about that of a single motor neuron, a single somatic motor neuron, meaning a neuron of the body that's going to be controlling muscle, hence that of a motor neuron, and then all the muscle fibers that one neuron is going to stimulate, that is a motor unit. This combination of the nerve cell and the muscle fibers. And it's going to be that of a single neuron, a single nerve cell, that has the potential to be innervating up to over a hundred muscle cells. And all those muscle cells are going to be contracting in unison. How? We've talked about muscle contraction. When we look at these fibers, we can see them scattered all throughout the belly of the muscle. And when we look at just how much strength is going to develop when it comes to muscle contraction, it's going to go back to the number of these motor units that are going to be activated to determine strength and muscle contraction. Oh, look at this. A single twitch contraction. We can do a myogram of this. Look at this. The fraction of time that we're looking at here is just measured in the tens of milliseconds, where we're looking at the force of contraction over time. We're looking at just a single action potential for that of a single motor neuron. And we're looking at all of the electrical stimulation of that one unit. What happens? Look what happens after we send this electrical signal. No contraction is really occurring during this latent period. And then the force of contraction builds during the contraction period it peaks, it levels off, and then it declines during the relaxation period, and we're ready for the next contraction. Usually, these twitch contractions are going to be somewhere between 20 and 200 milliseconds. Clearly, though, Pavlicek is not right. It's Pavla. What, help, help me again. Yes. How do I pronounce it? Pachowski. Pachowski. How many 
milliseconds is the twitch contraction we're seeing here. The one on the screen. Shilka's favorite television show is Hawaii. Five, five, I thought it was going to be Shilka. And yes, 5 0. Yes, you can see that it lasts 50 milliseconds. Can you see that now? Yeah. Good. That's what I wanted you to be able to see. Excellent. So, as we said, we're looking at force over time when it comes to a myogram. So, there are a few different parts of this myogram we mentioned. At first, after stimulation, you can see that there is no increase in the force of contraction, this latent period. What's happening here? Well, we need that calcium for contraction. So it takes a little bit of time for that calcium to exit out of the warehouse and leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Any of the elastic proteins that we have still have some slack in them. We need to pull on those elastic components, make them more hot. That's what's happening during the latent period. Then, as we start sliding our thick and thin filaments past one another, we see the increase in force. As we begin to pump that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and recovering those binding sites, we're going to be relaxing. Somewhere for each of these between about 10 and 100 milliseconds. Pavel check? Is that right yet? Uh, tell me again. Pachowski. Pachowski. You, see, you don't even know it. Pachowski. I'm trying She's to She's simplifying it. Yes. Wait, how do you actually say it? How, what, what was that? <laughs> Try to do that again. Pahowski? Pahowski? I'm going to try to do it phonetically. Pahowski. <laughs> Pahowski. Okay. Is that close? Pahowski. Yeah. There's no house. <laughs> Did you say house? You say it again. Pahowski. Pahowski? Is it more like a... Pahowski. Pahowski. It's an R. It's like you roll your tongue. I can't roll my tongue. <laughs> That's the closest I can get. Pahowski. Close, close. Good. Pahowski, what I wanted to ask you was, how long did the contraction period last year? 50. Contraction period. Oh, um, 20? No, 30. <laughs> Somewhere between 20 and 30 milliseconds. Pahowski, nicely done. Not usually. The latent period ever really included in anything? Not really. It's usually so short. We can talk about the total time. We'll just add a couple milliseconds. We should also mention the refractory period. And this, no matter how hard we try and how much we try to stimulate, we're not going to be able to excite these fibers because they have lost their excitability. Who can explain to me why they've lost their excitability in one sentence? Haviz? One sentence. Wait, when I said one sentence, you answered me with one sentence? Well, I'm talking about the second. Yes, one sentence. And you got to wait for the, the action potential of the background. Haviz just said, that we've lost excitability because we haven't even finished dealing with the current action potential. If we're not even done with the current action potential, we're not going to be able to be excited by another one. That's exactly what I wanted. Nicely done. And this refractory period differs depending upon the muscle type. It's much shorter for skeletal muscle than it is for cardiac muscle. Oh, look at this. Who, who wants to tell us about the time that they, um, that they stepped on their rusty nail and they got tetanus? Trying to get tetanus. Well, that doesn't count then. Anyone? Cut by a rusty saw blade. Cut by a rusty saw blade. Oh, this sounds good. And then what happened? I had to go to the doctor because uh, I was having information to the site of this little bit right here. It's on the and uh, tell me about your muscle contraction. Uh, it was, it just wanted my arm wanted to stay like this the whole entire time. I 
then you only extend it back out. Oh, we were rigid. Why is that? Well, when we look at a single twitch, we can see one single action potential. And we can see how much force is going to be generated. What happens, though, if we fire one action potential after another, where there is not a lot of time that transpires between the two? Look at this. The force of contraction now, where that second action potential causes the total force of contraction to be much greater. We can get something known as unfused tetanus, where the amount of contraction keeps building and building and building because of how frequent these active potentials are. We get fused tetanus, where we have this peak and this maximum force of contraction when we frequently stimulate that muscle, where the time between action potentials is very, very small, just a few milliseconds. Hold up. Why would it keep building? Wouldn't it be like less and less like progressively because it would take more effort since it just kind of used up what it did? Like why does it build up instead? We're, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So we can talk about that which is unfused. And the reason it is unfused is because there's a little bit of time for relaxation between each of these stimuli. But what Bolda wanted to know is... Uh, what happens when it comes to fused tetanus? Well, because these active potentials are so frequent, there is no time for relaxation. So if there is no time for relaxation, it's just contraction, and contraction, and contraction, and contraction. All of those contractions with no relaxation cause that great amount of force to occur. But we're talking about very, very frequent potentials. We're talking about being fired off as many as 100 times in a second. So when it comes to these action potentials, the reason that we can build the amount of force that can occur is because of the amount of calcium that is going to be remaining within the cytoplasm of the muscle, within the sarcoplasm. So we can add the force of contraction to, from the first to the second because there is not any relaxation time that's allowed to occur. When it comes to firing off a muscle, though, for some controlled, fine movements, like um, every so often Chilka pulls his phone out of his pocket, and he pulls up Angry Birds, Star Wars, Angry Birds, and he starts playing Angry Birds on his phone like he is in the back right now. How is Shulka able to do that? How can he have all of these fine motor movements to play Angry Birds rather than these big, jerky motions? Well, when it comes to motor unit recruitment, there's going to be some fibers within a muscle that are going to be contracting and others that are going to be relaxing at the same time. And we can look at the number of fibers per nerve. And when it comes to some of those muscles for fine motion, we have smaller motor units where we don't have as many fibers per nerve particularly when it comes to those muscles in the forearm, hands, and wrist. If you uh, look at Shilka in the back, he is also a stunning example of muscle tone. And uh, by that I mean, when we're looking at his um, bicep brachii, you can see it bulging through his Angry Birds shirt. And the question is just, why is it bulging as much as it is. Why is his muscle firm even though he is just cool and relaxed sitting in the back of the room not moving? Well, because we're going to be alternating this period of contraction and relaxation in the muscle fibers in these muscles. And this is how we have such great posture in this room that I can observe from all of you when it comes to your back muscles. Yes. Well, I'm doing my best now to remember <laughs> to uh, try and uh, and uh, sit up straight because uh, what don't I want to develop when I get older? Mm -hmm. Any of those spinal okay, column yes. abnormalities that we have talked about in the past? Yes. This is how we uh, maintain blood pressure also when it comes to our smooth muscle and muscle tone in those smooth muscles. 
we can talk about a few different types of contraction when we are either moving a load or not moving a load. Isotonic and isometric contraction. Now remind me so we're all on the same page on these. Iso denotes what? Isolation symbol. One. One. Oh, the same. Yeah, I'll accept that. So isometric, same length, not moving. So an isometric contraction is when no movement occurs. Look at that. You're contracting the muscle. You're just holding that book out in front of you, but the length of the muscle is not changing. So we're generating this tension without shortening the muscle. This differs, though, during an isotonic contraction when you can see where we're going to be moving the load, where we're moving this book in our hands. When we shorten the muscle to produce force, that's going to be a concentric contraction. When we're bringing that book up, where an eccentric contraction is when that muscle is lengthening as we are going to extend that elbow. Do we have any type of variation skeletal muscle? Of course we do, which is how we have that of both red and white muscle fibers. Why do they look differently? Well, we look at what the composition of the intracellular structures is going to be in these fibers. Do we see a lot of things that are going to look red, i.e. that of myoglobin, capillary beds, mitochondria? We find those things in the red fibers. Where we have less capillary beds, our tissue has that more of a pale appearance, hence we have the appearance of white fibers. And depending upon what type of fibers we're looking at, it's going to influence just how fast ATPase is going to hydrolyze ATP in the contraction cycle. Different fibers are also going to have varying degrees of resistance to fatigue based upon their ability to use and generate ATP. So when we look at some of these muscle fibers, we can classify those into those that are going to be slow oxidative fibers and those that are going to be fast oxidative and glycolytic fibers. When it comes to those slow fibers, these are the ones that we are going to be using when it comes to sustained contractions. In order to, that's right, sit upright and maintain posture. Whereas when it comes to our fast glycolytic fibers, these, what we call fast twitch A and B, we're going to use these when it comes to splitting ATP very fast for those speed activities, or when it comes to anaerobic activity, such as, Shilk, what are you lifting back there? What are you, uh, lots of, lots of things, just lifting books. Shilk, what can you bench press? <laughs> can you lift the bar by itself without any weight on it? Good, that's, a, that's what I care about. And you can balance the bar, can't you? You don't drop the bar, do you? Good, good. good, good, good. When it comes to uh, fiber types, as we mentioned before, there is a mixture of these different fiber types that we have within the muscle. It's not A muscle isn't going to be exclusively just one type of fiber, but depending upon what the muscle is used for, um, the uh, proportions of those fibers will vary from one muscle to another. For example, those muscles, those muscles of posture that we have in the back and the neck, those are going to be more along the lines of where we find slow oxidative fibers. Where when it comes to those muscles that are going to be useful for us to... Shilka, what do you use your arm muscles for and your shoulder for? You ever throw any punches? Sure. Sure. Good. Excellent. So, we find more of those fast glycolytic fibers there. Excellent. Now, um, you might not believe me, but one of the ways that Chilka can, of course, uh, increase his uh, muscle mass would be, of course, to abuse anabolic steroids. Um, of course, when it comes to uh, the uh, side effect profile of steroids, it's usually not worth it. But when you get paid millions of dollars in bonuses, depending upon how many home runs you can hit in a season, it's still not worth it. Uh, but when it comes, <laughs> when it comes to... Uh, damage, um, oh, it's, it's awful. We can get liver cancer and kidney damage and heart swing, heart disease and mood swings. Oh, even when you're female, oh, um, oh, uh, 
facial hair, deep voices, even, um, you do. I used to have a student who sat in the back corner that would love to abuse steroids. He had acne all over, but he was huge. Um, oh, even in women you can get things like clitomegaly. Ew. What's that? A female penis. Yes. But if you're male, oh, testicular atrophy and alopecia. Okay, I'm done talking about skeletal muscle. Questions? Questions? Um, for a booking, you said that the staff like a litter system, is that, um, like the lab, there was a question in here, it's like all three of them in here? 